Hello, Server Nation, and welcome back to Process Server Daily. I'm your host, Mighty Mike, and I want to personally thank you for listening to my show. As a process server, I know how difficult it can be to find the right resource just when you need them. I've developed a solution. ServerNation.us is a website that my sons and I built specifically with you in mind. Find a server, find a court, or simply find the right out-of-state affidavit. Don't forget to enter your contact details so you can be found to ServerNation.us. The number one resource for legal support professionals. Server Nation, you are listening to Money Mike and his awesome podcast. Davey Keith is the manager of Quantum Process and has been in business since 1997. He is a past president and founding member of Mississippi Association of Professional Process Servers. He has also been a member of NAP since 2000. Davey owns and operates a business selling Title II firearms and spends his free time teaching karate as a Shotokan black belt. Davey, take a minute to fill in the gaps and tell us a little bit about your personal life. Well, I'm... uh over the hill just uh turned 44 i think this year if i remember correctly and i've been involved in the process industry since probably around 97 and uh started out as a private investigator in this in in private work and did that for about mm, three years or so and then started doing uh process serving and kind of like that a lot better and um but as far as personal life, you know, uh, do have quantum process. That is what keeps me busy Monday through Friday. And then, um, weekends, I'm I'm usually doing other things, but, uh, fortunately I've gotten to the point where I have a lot of, a lot of people that serve for me. So I'm more or less just manage my company now. That's excellent. When you can get to a point where um, you're able to just kind of control your business and, and spend your time in the office, making sure that everything is good. Do you ever get out there and show them how it's done? <laughs> well, fortunately, I have uh, a team of really good servers, and I like to offer, you know, as I review the serves, offer suggestions and and just experience. Uh, a lot, some of the servers have been doing it longer than I have. Oh, wow. You know, I consider going out. Uh, I, I do go out when I can, you know, just some local local serves. It's It works better for me to kind of control, and, you know, I, I still enjoy I really – it's, it's – ironic because I said that I would never get to that point and uh, it just kind of happened. Yeah. And it, and it does happen. So Dave, before we move on too far into your business, because I know you're doing a lot of awesome things and you got some cool stories to tell today. How many kids do you have? Sure. I have uh, three that I know of and uh, let's see. I have, <laughs> no, seriously. I, I have three. Uh, Kaden, he's uh, turning 14 next month and Josh just turned 12 this month and Michaela, she's nine great wife. We've been married 16 years. Things real going real well there. That's awesome. That's awesome. F- family is most important. And absolutely, you know, as process servers, we go out there and sometimes we come home. I mean, to me, it's, it's what makes the job worth it. You know, you come back sure. and you see your kids and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going out and sacrificing all this time. It's for something. Right. So that's why I like to start the podcast with the family. Some people don't want to really linger on it because they don't want everyone to know their personal life, but <laughs> now, that's pretty easy to find these days with Facebook. If you're on Facebook, there's hardly any secrets anymore. That's true. That's true so how did you get started you said you're a private investigator but how tell me the story who gave you your start who did you meet or how that happened well ever since i was walking and kept far back as i can remember i wanted to be in law enforcement it was just something about that field that really appealed to me i went to went to college got a four-year degree in criminal justice and that was what i had my my heart set on because i really enjoyed everything there was about law enforcement so i got Got involved in that, worked at a small police department, had a had a bad motorcycle wreck. I used to ride motorcycles quite a bit. And while I was in the hospital recovering from that, a job that I'd really wanted in law enforcement, they said that I was going to be able to go to that particular academy. But in the meantime, as I was recovering, I had decided to start kind of on my own. I'm, I'm fourth generation self-employed and started doing some PI work and it just kind of hit the ground running. I remember back Before I did any of this, a a friend of mine had told me, you know what you really need to do? You need to try to serve 
papers. And I, and I said, what is that? <laughs> he said, well, you go out and you serve a core paper. And I said, okay, well, that might be something. So it did, it was integrated into my Keith investigations was the name of my business, but it really didn't take off until, you know, I kind of got burnt out in the PI field and um, let the law enforcement uh, job go. And I started doing that and eventually shifted over to doing process serving full time. I can't really remember who gave me my first serve, but it really all of this just happened. It never really was planned. And that was really what's kind of awesome about it. I'm a strong believer in faith and God. And, I, I, you know, this was not if you would have told me in college or growing up, this is what you're going to be. You're going to have a process serving company. I would have been kind of disappointed. <laughs> Because it didn't sound very exciting, and I wanted a life full of excitement, but um, it just kind of happened, you know, and that's the weird part about it. But it's it's built on itself and continues to do that. And, you know, today we do very little advertising um, because you don't have to really. So it just worked out. That's great. So you so you started your business and you, as private investigation, and you, do you uh-huh. still do private investigation? No. I, you know, I tell people when they – I still get calls for something that I haven't been doing for 16 years, and I tell them, you know, if you offer me $50,000 to do a case, I don't think I would take it. Really? It's it's one of those things that, you know, it's really good that it happened because actually that's how I met my wife. Um, I was hired by my future mother-in-law at the time. And uh, the more I got to know her, the more, you know, I really felt like she was a very upstanding, really, really good person. And at the time, I was kind of looking for a wife. And so I asked her, I said, do you happen to have a daughter? And she said, yes, I do. <laughs> and so oh, that's man. how I met my wife. And, you know, I had to meet her dad after everything you know, kind of came out. That was kind of awkward, but he's a really good guy. And everything worked out. Davey, you got a lot going on. And there's a reason why you're on my show. I heard you tell an awesome story and I, and I wanted to get into the different stories and that's what makes um, the podcast process server daily, such a cool podcast and why we uh, are getting more listeners every day. You're full of experiences and um, let's get to your worst experience working in the field. Sure. You know, my worst experience has probably been one of my greatest lessons. I am a hard charger. I don't give up. You know, when someone doesn't want to be served, that, that made me more determined to get it done. And, you know, I've learned over the years that not only is it, you know, not a good idea to keep going when, when there is poss- potentially, it's potentially dangerous serve, but when someone just doesn't want to be served, I know that sounds counterintuitive to what we do, but there's serves that you should back off from. And w- the experience that I'll tell you about is one that has helped me understand how to do that and how to, you know, and if a situation is, is going bad, how to hire another, get another server in there, just get a fresh face or look at it from a different angle. But this happened probably around six, seven, eight years ago. But I had a, uh, just a regular subpoena for deposition. It was in a domestic matter. And the person I was trying to serve was a teacher who happened to be a counselor um, as well for a child that was, you know, caught up, you know, in the divorce, you know, you have the child custody. For whatever reason, the um, plaintiff needed to subpoena this teacher to have a deposition. So, you know, I'm thinking this can't be any big deal, you know, first mistake. Any, any kind of domestic service, you have to really do yourself a favor and read the complaint, kind of get a background talk to the attorney to make sure there's nothing in there. You know, I went to the house or either I called the lady. I can't remember which one I did first. Because we, I've done that before. Just, hey, my name's Davey Keith. Um, I have a subpoena I need to give you and diffuse the situation if there's any, kind of get a feel for the situation. And I, again, that sounds like, well, why would you want to do that? Then they're not going to come to the door. It's just different strategies. So I made contact or I left a voicemail. Her husband called me back and he was very, very upset, very belligerent, um, very, just very rude. And I said, look, you know, you're former law enforcement, I'm former law enforcement. I said, you know, this is nothing personal. I said, you know, even I tell people to this day, if I give you this opinion, you don't want to go, you know, you do it, do what you want to. It's not, it's up to you. This is still free country. You know, after that conversation, uh, it was a clue that especially some of the things he said, it probably wasn't the best idea to proceed with the service. But nonetheless, I did. Went out to the house, knocked on the door. Nobody would answer the door. Her car was there. So I kind of backed off for a minute and sat and thought. And I, I have this, had this strategy. I no longer use it. But, you know, squeaky wheel gets the wall, no matter who you're dealing with. And uh, I knocked on the door for probably a couple minutes, not, not just 
beating down the door, just knocking the door, hoping that um, she'd get tired and come to the door and answer it, or either the police would get called. That was the strategy because I had called the sheriff's department, said, hey, if you get a call, I'm at this address trying to serve this paper. Okay, that's fine. And I checked with a neighbor. The neighbor said, she's home. So after knocking on the door for four or five minutes, I uh, did another little strategy, which was to leave get in the car, drive around, stay, you know, make the block or, or go a mile or two in, in return. And I can't tell you how many people I've caught outside looking around, seeing if anything's been disturbed. When I came back, she was leaving the house, walking out of the house, and a sheriff was pulling in. And I said, well, this is good. You know, I'm going to get this served. Well, I saw who the deputy was, and that was the first major sign that I needed to just drive on because I'd had problems with this deputy before interfering with service. I had talked to the sheriff about this Kim and he said, if you ever have a problem with him, just let me know. Well, I made the decision to go ahead and get out. And I didn't park behind him because tactically speaking, they don't like when you block them in or whatever. So I pulled into the neighbor's house, walked out. He still didn't see me. So as, as I got closer, I said, hey, sheriff, his name. And I said, uh, how you doing? He said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Davey Keith. I'm the one that I called you guys about the service. And so he shouted to me to stay to stay at my car. And when he said that, I said, you know what? This is not going to go well. So I stayed at my car and he walked over to the lady and they proceeded to have a conversation. And this was, I guess, another bad decision on my part. I should have been patient, just stood there without saying a word. But after what seemed to me like several minutes, I said, ma'am, I'm just here to serve you a paper. So I laid it on the ground and was went to get back in my car. And he ran up to me full sprint and had his taser out. And he said, if you move, I'm tasing you. So I just stood there. So he grabbed me and threw me on my car, the, the hood of my car, hard enough to dent my car, the hood, and put me in cuffs and told me to stay, to sit down on the hood of my car. So I did. And he went back over to the lady. And at the time I was wearing Bluetooth, you know, this was, I guess that was the thing back then, but I was able to inch my shoulder over and, and double click the button. And it called uh, somebody and I said, hey, I need you to call this attorney, tell him to call the sheriff and uh, tell him, you know, what's going on. So anyway, the word got back to the, to, to the client who called the sheriff. Well, I stayed in cuffs and he saw me talking on that. So he ran over, ripped it off my head and said, do you have any other phones? You know, he was, scre- he was kind of screaming at me. I said, no, no, I don't. So he took me and put me in his patrol car. And I sat there for about at least an hour while they talked and talked and talked. So he gets in the car, doesn't say a word. We drive to the jail. Mind you, I've taken people to jail, but I've never been in jail, like incarcerated. So I'm not feeling very good about this situation. And when we get to the jail, um, he made some comments to me, you know, about, you know, welcome to my county. And this is what you get when you act stupid or something. And I didn't say anything. So they strip search me and uh, put me in an orange jumpsuit, put me in leg irons, um, and then also hand irons they actually had me stand on the wall for about 30 minutes. And I, I didn't complain. I just stood there, throw me in the drunk tank with another guy and made good friends with him. And so I'm thinking this is really, I don't know what's going to happen here because hours and hours and hours were going by. Here you are serving legal process, right? It's all about perception. Here you are a process server who's been in law enforcement before been in, in the situ. I was just in a situation like this the other day where I got out of the car and, and walked up when they told me to stay in the car. And I said, listen, I'm already serving her. And I served her and walked away. They listened to me. But in this case, this was a guy you've had a problem with before. Take So you're already at this point. I just want to like emphasize you're in an orange jumpsuit as a process server in jail sitting next to someone who potentially you could have arrested before in the past probably not right but now you're friends with the guy or you're at least uh, acquaintances with the guy where does it go from there well i had um anytime i would have a confrontational serve back then i would call my wife before and then as soon as i got through i'd call her and say everything's fine well i had called her and told her the situation and she never hears back from me because I didn't think about telling the attorney to call her. So after an hour or so, or she's wondering what, what happened to him. Is he dead? And so I'm sitting there in jail and it is a very bad feeling. <laughs> you know, even though you know that it's going to turn out okay and what possibly, but see, at this point, I didn't know what he was going to charge me with. I didn't know. See, I carry a gun. I'm a concealed carry permit, strong Second Amendment supporter. Obviously, I have a firearms business, and I don't believe in – I never, ever, ever want to shoot anyone. I have pulled my gun. That was the bad, other bad service I was going to tell you about. So I'm thinking, okay, is he going to charge me, say something that I that I tried to use this – what story did they concoct while – 
this time frame went on, they would never tell me what I was charged with, which was another problem. But, you know, I'm in jail and it goes for eight hours. And finally, they tell me someone's here to see you. And it's my wife. So I get out and they let me bond out. And if it turns out they had five charges on me, they impounded my car. I mean, it's just blown me away. What, what can you possibly be charging me with? Well, I'll tell you. Trespassing, criminal trespass, family disturbance, uh, fair to obey a lawful order. Um, and I think the other one was impersonating a police officer. I had a badge at the time, and this is another thing, story we can talk about. It clearly said process server. I don't promote badges. I can go on and on and on about that, and not just this one experience. But anyway, and I had made it clear to her and her husband that I was a process server. I was not law enforcement, but they charged me with it anyway. So um, we get out, we go get my car, and this is about $2,000 by the time I pay the bond and, and getting the car back. I'm, I'm glad he didn't charge me with, say that I had, you know, used the firearm in, in, in this, you know, charged me with some really bad, you know, it was all misdemeanors. Well, the next day, um, she finds out that I'm going to charge her with interference with process because in the state of Mississippi, uh, Mississippi Code 97975, any person who interferes or avoids process can be charged with a criminal offense. So at this time, we've got attorneys. So her attorney calls my attorney and says, oh, wait a minute. She's going to, if you won't charge her with that, she's going to drop all her charges. And at the time I was like, that's fine because i I don't have any problem with her. The my problem is with that deputy because he's the one who trumped this up. And there was going to be that one charge with him, which was disorderly conduct. So that went away. You know, I had to sign that I wouldn't sue her. That and I was and I was fine with that because you know she didn't want to be served and whatever that's fine. But the way the deputy handled this, my my bone was with him of contention. That took about two. Well, it took about a year to finally go to court on this and. We're standing in court. He gets up in court and says that he told me to stay at my car, and he told me that five times, and I kept charging him or, or breaking away from my car. I got on the stand. I said, Your Honor, that's a complete lie. I said, I, prior law enforcement, he told me to stay at my car. I stayed at my car. I said, that's not the truth. And uh, he found me guilty anyway, went on the officer's testimony, which conveniently they don't have cameras or audio at the time. And the statement he had made to me in jail uh, conveniently disappeared. Something, a lightning had hit the jail is what they said and destroyed the recording. So I'm, uh, I'm convicted of, a, of criminal uh, disorderly conduct, which is a misdemeanor, but I wasn't going to let that lie. Um, so I sued him for false arrest. I hired three different attorneys because the first one turned out to be a drunk. The second one just wasn't aggressive enough. And the third one was the right one. We started doing depositions with her and the, and the deputy. All of a sudden, the de her testimony was not, act was not lining up with what he said I did. So they're beginning to think, uh-oh, we got a problem. She's not saying, she's saying that I stayed in my car, which was what I did. So they start talking, okay, we want to settle. And I told the attorney, you know, this is not about money. This is about what he did. And I did an investigation into him and there was multiple reports all throughout the county of people he had done wrong. Many deputies that worked there did not like him. So anyway, long story short, they offered a settlement. I went ahead and took the settlement, which was only about, cost me 10 grand, all the attorneys and everything. It was a $13,000 settlement or so whatever. I made 3000, but it was not worth, it was worth the learning experience. And ultimately what happened was he got let go. Uh, I got the settlement and I got that charge dropped. So it took me two years and, you know, $10,000 and a lot of mental anguish. But out of this, I have learned one important lesson. Never, ever, ever assume that just because you're acting as an arm of the law and that you're, and that you're doing, even if you're not doing anything wrong, that you can't get in trouble or be charged with something. And when there is a, what I didn't know at the time was that he was friends with her husband, we used to work on the force together. So this was kind of a, a brother you know, deal. When I encounter confrontation, severe confrontation, or when people are absolutely adverse to getting served, to back off the serving, mean, it's not worth me getting into uh, a physical confrontation, getting sued, getting arrested. And sometimes I just send a different server. More often now, I send the sheriff's department, and we have a really good server here locally, which it wasn't in my county anyway. But that was that was a really big learning experience.
So Davey, that's an awesome thing to take from your story. I enjoyed that story. Tell me about, and there's a lot of them I'm sure in your life, but tell me about your greatest experience working in the field. I think that perhaps it is a culmination of people that I've been able to meet. I can't tell you on the number of occasions that I've been invited for dinner. I've been invited back to people's houses in the South. We're, they're very, you know, people are very hospitality oriented. And when I go out to serve and I've seen some of your videos, I don't come up there and say, I'm looking for so-and-so. And I get up there and say, hey, do y'all believe we got that six inches of snow this year? Yeah. You know, or isn't it a beautiful day? And whatever I need to do to break the ice, because I'm there to get this job served, but I'm also there because you're dealing with people. And I tell people all the time, just because you're getting served with papers doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. That's why, you know, I'm actually doing you a favor by being here. And I know you don't think that, but if it, if I wasn't here to notify you of what's going on, you'd never know. People could railroad you in a court action. But the greatest experiences I've had are been able to meet with people and actually get very, very personal information of a situation and perhaps even share my faith. Uh, I have prayed with people on a number of occasions, and I'm not saying that to toot my horn. It's just because you get to meet people in probably some of the, I know when this happened to me, or anytime you've got a lawsuit hanging over your head, it's, it's a very bad experience. And when you can actually offer comfort to someone in the smallest way, whatever that may be, that's been probably the, the greatest reward or best experience I've had you know, being able to help people hang on when they're, this could be the, the straw that makes the camel's back. And I've seen people, I've, we all know people who've committed suicide. And this may be the very last thing that pushes someone over the edge. And I've had situations where people admitted to me, you know, I was contemplating that. And I said, look, this is why you need to live. This is why you need to keep going. All this stuff is going to go away. This time next year, this is not even going to be an issue. So being able to meet the people, we have some people we've served so many times, and I've made really good friends. Um, And and I I take all the server jokes in, in stride, you know, (laughs) <laughs> about, uh, you know, if I saw you coming, I'd have ran the other way. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people say that. <laughs> so it's hard to nail down one exact one, but I, I do have one. I just can't really say, I just can't go into details. But she uh, was basically, you know, being sued and, and had no money and was trying to raise some kids. And we were able to help her in a small way. And that, that was probably one of the most rewarding things. That's awesome. So there's a couple things I got from your story. So first of all, you're human. We're all human. We get out there, we're out there serving. Yeah, we don't want the the feeling of rejection, the feeling of somebody like yelling at us. We don't want that. But the truth is when you get out there, you do have a job to do. Okay. Uh-huh. You get the job done, but it doesn't mean you can't be professional. It doesn't mean you can't uh-huh. be a human. I don't know. You said you saw some of my videos. And I don't know if it's for them or for me, but I feel like when I'm like, Hey, I love this porch. Did you build this deck? And uh-huh. they're like, Yeah, who are you? <laughs> I'm a, uh-huh. I'm a processor. Yeah, that's the part that I don't really want. We don't have to talk about that too much. Here's that. But seriously, what did you use to varnish this deck? You know, yeah. Yeah, I've had like long conversations with guys that are just really cool or, you know. Um, had- and that's why I'd like to iterate just quickly that we don't employ gimmicks. For the most part, we don't employ um, 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 deceitful tactics. I mean, there's going to be some people that you absolutely know without a doubt you're going to have to use some kind of, you you may choose to use some kind of tactic that is not, that makes them think you're there for another reason. But it just Mm -hmm. makes me feel icky. The longer I do this, the more I like to knock on the door, tell them my name and I'm trying to get in touch with Mm so-and-so. And well, he's not here. Okay. Well, here's my, phone number can you tell them to give me a call i don't have to go into what it is if they ask i'll say sure it's court Mm -hmm. papers not a big deal you know i don't i don't i do a lot of straightforward um serving that's kind of where i've come to and and I appreciate that you've mentioned, Davey, I appreciate that you mentioned faith. Uh, faith is a big part of my life, too. I know that I'm a Second Amendment supporter. I'm a, a you know, conservative. And, but the thing is, I know there are so many people out there that have different views, and I don't want mm-hmm. them to think that I judge them differently. So I don't go into it a lot. But I got to tell you, there's a lot to that when it comes to serving. Getting out of the car, it's pitch dark outside. You know there's a dog somewhere. You're out in the middle of nowhere in the country. If you don't have faith that somebody's looking out for you, then you must be the baddest man pajama out there. You know what I mean? Well, I had another situation. Won't make this one very long at all, but there was several uh, people. I had to serve some adoption papers on a guy. There was three ex-cons. I didn't know they were ex-con. One of them actually killed someone. So I got out to serve him, and it turned into a scuffle. He pushed me, 
And when he did, I had my pepper spray in my hand, so I sprayed him. Well, that kept the other two guys from jumping me, and which would have been a deadly force situation. Three guys against me. Got back to my car, got out of there. So intermediate level of force is also good, carrying pepper spray, a big proponent of that. Um, but that intermediate level of force actually saved either my life or their life because I have no doubt they wanted to jump me. When I got back to my car, they started beating on my car. Wow, Mississippi process servers, man, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. a lot of this has to do with how you approach people yeah. and knowing when not to approach people. If they're out there drinking or using, don't walk up there and try to serve them a paper. Bad time. Yeah. Yeah, timing and place, I call it prime time. You know, I don't want to go. So if somebody tells me just one little tip, if um, someone tells me that there's a a guy they need to have served and he's uh, an alcoholic, I'm not going at nighttime. I'm not going at 6 p.m. because I know he's going to be drunk. I'm going Mm -hmm. at 9 a.m., 8 a.m., something like that because he's going to be hungry. He might be a little cranky, Mm -hmm. but it'll be a little bit more clear headed. And Mm -hmm. every time I've done that, it's worked out. I mean, I had to serve a guy in his underwear on his front lawn, you know, at, uh, at, you know, 6.30 in the morning one time because they said he starts drinking as soon as he wakes up. So I was Mm -hmm. there at 6.30. I was going to say, with an alcoholic, you really never know when it's going to be the best or worst time. Yeah, exactly. So you got a lot going on. It's a, I feel like Server Nation is going to be able to learn a lot um, as far as defense from this. Uh, podcast. So I'm really excited about that. But what kind of advice do you want to give to the struggling server out there right now that's that's trying to build his business? Okay. So just a few short, uh, really good tips that I've I've learned over, over the years. Um, first of all, you know, every opportunity you have, speak with that attorney in the courthouse, promote yourself, join as many process serving directories as you can. Go the extra mile for your client. Your client's paying you $50, whatever to serve. Go to that second an address. Do a skip trace. Go the extra mile as often as you can to put, get your foot in the door and to prove yourself. You know, we're to the point where we don't, you know, guarantee service. We guarantee to make X number of attempts, but go the extra mile. When you're responding to NAPS request or whatever that you may get, have a signature line because I can't tell you the number of people I, I don't even respond to them. If they respond back from their iPhone, there's no signature line, uh, $50 and that's it. You know, and, and be specific when they ask you how much for how many attempts to, to to attempt to serve, read what they're asking and respond to their questions briefly. Because I look for people who have an attention to detail. Because if they're responding back with an attention to detail and they have a signature line, you know, that shows me that they're on top of their game. Uh, but at every opportunity you have, and also have another business. Don't depend, don't get a big business loan trying to get into the industry. Have a, uh, a source of income and build your let your business build itself on its own. Don't go out and get a $20,000 loan. I think you'd need that. All of my businesses were built from the ground up. Didn't start with a huge buy-in. You don't have to have costly soft process server software. You can start just a simple spreadsheet or something. So those are some of the few things that I've found that I've, that I encourage. That's awesome. That's golden, golden nuggets raining down on server nation right now. <laughs> that is, that is awesome. So what are you working on right now that has you most excited, most fired up? Oh, well in life, I'm actually, um, bought a Humvee, a military Humvee and, um, just, awesome. just playing with that. There's so many, it's the, I thought the Jeep was the ultimate Lego vehicle. But I have I found out that this military vehicle, there's so many things you can do. You know, I, ha- I wouldn't say that I'm a prepper per se, but I like to read a lot about end time apocalyptic type scenarios. <laughs> so I'm working on my Humvee. Uh, I think I was uh, painting it because you can spray paint it and it looks cool. You know, don't even have, you could just sit there with a spray can. And so I'm doing that and I see my, my daughter kicking the soccer ball. And I think to myself, I should probably should go over there and kick the ball with her. Well, I got I got back focused on what I was doing and and looked up. She's kicking the ball. I should go kick the ball with her. So the third time, I say, okay. So I put the paint can down. I go over there, and we kick the ball for like thirty minutes. That probably was the most important thing I did that day, because you know, no matter what. I have on my agenda. It's so easy as a workaholic, I guess you would say, or as a very focused person to forget some of the most important things. And that's making sure that you spend time with your children and your wife. Because I can tell you when I was out serving from dusk to uh, dawn to dusk that, you know, it affected my, my family life. And sometimes, unfortunately, early on, you may have to do that. But, you know, once you can get to where you can, when you have time, for me, the most important thing is trying to remember it's not all about me. 
you know, I've got other people in my life I want to do things with that I need to do things with so that it will build that, you know, good relationships. Yeah. Prior proper planning prevents problems has always been my like my five P's that I remember whenever I start planning. And I want to bring that up only because I have the similar situation. I we, I call it prom things, if you will. Like mm-hmm. I get prompted like, okay, uh, like a, a good example similar is uh, similar to your painting example. Um, I'm on the couch playing with my iPad. I'm always creating new graphics fix for the mm-hmm. podcast or something using Canva. And uh, my daughter's like, Daddy, you said you were going to play Barbies with me. <laughs> and, you know, she's got this little dollhouse and she's this perfect little girl and she's only five. So, mm. um, And so I'll go play with her. And uh, But sometimes I'm like, okay, you set the Barbies up on the table for tea time and then I'll come. Then mm-hmm. I'll come. Once you got that ready, I'll come. <laughs> it's just me putting it up. <laughs> One of the things that I found out is you don't have to necessarily spend vast amounts of time doing these things it can be simple as five minutes doing something and to them that i don't know they're on Mm -hmm. a different time scale you know little things can can really make a big difference and that's why i go back to out when you're out serving and you say a kind word to someone while you're serving or you actually make a friend out of a person than an enemy words make a difference and little words can make a huge difference in people's lives and that prompting that you're talking about may be something that you need to say to that person that could actually alter the course of their entire life that's so true that's so true. I had a friend that called me. He wasn't my friend. I wasn't sure. I was kind of mean to him in high school. And one time, and I, I really liked him actually when we were adults. I didn't understand why I treated him the way I did in high school. But he told me, he called me pal. Mm-hmm. He goes, hey, pal, I'll see you tomorrow. And just him saying pal was like, wait, are we are we cool? Mm-hmm. I think we're cool now. You know, and it was mm-hmm. just like that one word. So it's so powerful what one word can do. And so mm-hmm. Server Nation, Davey's been dropping some major value bombs on us today, but prepare yourself because we're headed into the rapid fire round right after a word from our sponsor. Server Nation, if you like this story and you have a great story, go to our website, processerverdaily.com forward slash BA guest. You can check out our questions at www.processerverdaily.com forward slash flow. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back to the show, Server Nation. Davey, are you ready for the rapid fire round? I am. All right. If you could recommend one app, what would it be and why? Serve Manager. It's user friendly, has a very easy learning curve, and your servers, the ability for your servers and your clients to be able to navigate your software is very important. I think the the intuitive ability to be able to, within five minutes, have somebody, a client, which we don't require this, but we say, if you want to, once you're online, you can actually put your papers, upload them, and everybody in the office sees them, and you know it's user friendly, and that's what you need. You don't need complicated bells and whistles. I've evaluated most of the software out there, and it took took me 10 years to to get off of what I was using. Davey, what is your favorite skip, trace, tip, or trick? Don't overlook the obvious. Take that person's phone number, plug it into Facebook, and if they listed that number with Facebook, it'll pull them up. It's so easy. I mean, a lot of people know that, but some people don't. No, that's a good one. I I can't tell you how often I go on Facebook, and I'll type in someone's name, and I'm like, I can't find them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I have their phone number, (laughs) and it works. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, there's there's multiple easy skip tracing tools to use, which, of course, we all know the credit headers, which is a base. And that's the thing I tell, especially new service or anyone for that matter. A skip trace is not a just a report you run and then you give them an address. It's getting for us. We get a verbal verification from a friend, neighbor, relative or other person. Uh, but I don't want to get too far into that without uh, answering your question. So what is your favorite tool for defense? I'm going to go with my my, my firearm. Um, it, okay. You know, it's not just to protect me. It may be to protect my family or someone else um, or, you know, everyone in Mississippi, nearly everyone in the South has a dog and those dogs can be quite dangerous at times. But I don't carry the weapon for intimidation or any any, any kind of anything like that. It's concealed. But if I if I, you know, my gun is on me ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time. And um, it's not that I'm afraid. I'm not afraid at all mainly because I have a gun and, and I have God, you know, God, I, I depend on him, but yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give up my gun. I'm not going to give it up very easily based on any past experiences of never having to be in a deadly force or, or deadly situation does not um, in any way change any statistic that you could be. So a lot of people use their past experiences to make, oh, I keep it in my car. 
my, you know, I keep it by my bed when I'm, you know, I'm in the living room. Home invasion mm-hmm. takes about, could take as little as three seconds before they're in. So I, I always warn people to never use your past experiences as a template to try to figure out what could happen in the future. What book would you recommend? I, <laughs> okay, this is where it gets weird. I like to read a uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian fiction. Uh, that's, that's a mouthful. I'll have to put that in the show notes so we can read it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it's about what would what would you do if if basically the the world your life ended as you know it um, in EMP uh, multiple any kind of disaster and I don't really like to get into the zombies I like real world stuff I love military history. I have a book about uh, one of the most prolific uh, snipers in the War of Northern Aggression, uh, Civil War. That is really good. Um, but, you know, I'm, right now I'm reading um, a C.G. Cooper book. I can't even remember the name of it. But the one I would recommend is The Survivalist. It's a very good series, very well written. And the only disclaim- the only thing I'll tell you, if you start reading it at night and you get into this kind of stuff, you know, I'll look over at the clock and it'll be three in the morning. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> got to get to bed. Okay. What's the greatest advice you've ever received? Greatest advice. My grandfather, um, before he died, he would tell me about the Depression, the Great Depression, and, and coming up through that. And I wouldn't say this is the – I don't know if this is the greatest advice because that's such a profound statement. But I would. that's just what comes to my mind, some of the things he told me. And he, he told me this, get out of debt and stay out of debt because if you're in debt and things go bad, you'll lose everything. But if you're out of debt and what you have will remain yours. And I've taken that and applied that. That's good. What would you do if you woke up today, had all of the same skills and knowledge, had no clients, a smartphone, a car, and only $100? What would you do in the next seven days to grow your business? Mm. Well, I'd burn that smartphone up with, I go to the mississippibar.org and I get email addresses and I start sending out uh, emails and I make it enticing for them to want to use me. Um, your first service is free. I want to get your business. Anywhere I could find where potential clients would be and selling myself as far as selling my product, not myself, <laughs> selling my product of what I can do. The, the $100, I'm probably going to have to spend that on gas to figure out where, which areas I'm going to go to. Getting at, getting my name out there any way I can and, and not really doing it in a cost-effective way. You know, people, uh, you give them a business card, they put it in their pocket, they probably never look at it again. Everybody does everything by email, electronic. Talking to a client, I might need you for a service coming up. Okay. Can I send you an email so you have my contact information? Sure. They give you your email, boom, you send an email right away. So use that smartphone to communicate. We funnel all as much communication as we can through email because it saves time. Trying to get out there and solicit whomever I could possibly work for and um, doing a $100 job for, for $10 to get my foot in the door, to get my, to prove myself. And eventually you have to, you know, kind of draw a line there of what you're going to do. You don't want to run yourself in the ground. No, I love that feedback. I love the, uh, the bar association. Um, that's really outside the box. Um, I love the email, uh, in the legal industry, we live and die by our emails, same as they used to live and die by their fax machine before. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, now it's the email. So Mm -hmm. I, I love, I love what you shared about the email, about getting people's email. People live and die by the email. This is, a, this is one thing I want to add to what you said, and then we'll wrap it up. If you could send one extra email a day, just one, think about it. That's 365 emails that you didn't send that you haven't been sending now. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it's not an email. Maybe it's a phone call. Go the step further, right, okay. uh, to get their email. Maybe you don't have their email address. I think that so many people, though, they have a block, a mental block that says, you know, there's nothing I can do as a person. You know, uh, I'm not lucky enough. And these are like stories that we tell ourselves inside. Mm-hmm. And you got to conquer those. Okay, you got to conquer those. So, Dave, I love what you've shared so far about uh, everything has been awesome. We've been dropping major value bombs on us today. I know we could probably talk for another two hours. Mm -hmm. You're full of stories. (laughs) Mr. Keith, this has been fun. What is the best way that we can connect with you? And then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Um, As previously mentioned, email is great. Keith at quantumprocess.com. My wife told me, uh, you've got to, you know, I was complaining about someone's email address being complicated. She's like, you have a complicated. And I was like, you know, I came out with a business (laughs) name, being in bed one night, and the next day decided to call myself. I read it out of a book. Uh, But email k-e-i-t-h at quantum q-u-a-n-t-u-m process.com and of course my phone number is cell phone number i'm not afraid to give that out so many people are afraid to give their cell phone out anyway 601 
319-2675. I'm on Facebook. You can actually Google Davey Keith and uh, my website will come up. I'm real easy to find. I don't really have many, many secrets when it comes to how do you find Davey Keith. So Davey, I want to personally thank you for coming on the show. I know Server Nation appreciates all of the value bombs that you dropped today. I've been impressed with your story and I'm excited to share it with the world. Until next time, Server Nation, you've been served up some awesomeness by Davey the Black Belt and Mighty Mike the Podcast Server. 